This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Hey, good morning. I am Dr. Susan Buttress, and this is Relatively Speaking. Thanks for listening. Today we're talking about... A topic very much related to what we talked about last week. We talked about loneliness last week, and if you didn't hear it, you might want to go back and listen to the podcast um, so that you can see how these two relate so well together. Belonging. We're talking about belonging today. It's a really simple word, but it has some pretty major deep meaning. Uh, to the to have the feeling of belonging can do a lot of things for you. It can improve motivation, sense of well-being, improves your health and happiness. And for most of us, that sense of belonging can feel like food and shelter. It can be as important as food and shelter. So, you know, the need for belonging begins very early. It, it, it starts really in infancy. Obviously, an infant can't survive without their mother, but that attachment happens very early, and the need to stay attached continues. Attachment's another whole topic, but it is part of belonging. Everyone doesn't, though, necessarily have a keen sense of belonging. And like I mentioned um, in our previous show, loneliness is on an increase in the last few years. Though loneliness is not exactly the opposite of belonging. And if you think about it, it's kind of hard to come up with the opposite of belonging other than just not belonging. But today I want to talk to you about how valuable it is and how um, I think sometimes people be are are a little bit confused about the fact that if someone lives alone, alone, they don't belong. But that's absolutely not true. Most people, most people who live alone um, may want to live alone or may not choose to. But most of those want to still belong. And, um, you know, Saul Levine, he was uh, someone, a professor emeritus of psychiatry um, out of the University of California in San Diego, has done a lot of writing just about human emotion and feelings and, and issues. And he wrote that a sense of belonging is a boon to life, while loneliness is the bane of life. And, and I would say that most of us would probably agree with that. You know, the, he also says, which, which I think is so interesting, is that belonging is one of the four Bs that are the cornerstones of how we evaluate how much we are worth, our worthiness. Um, the other ones besides belonging are being, believing, and benevolence. I think those are all really, really important. So remember those four four B's, and belonging is is one of them. So before I quick keep on going, like I always do, I want to say good morning to Jay, my producer. Hi, Jay. Morning. How are you? Good. Glad you're with us today again. Yeah, contemplating those four Bs. It's very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And they're they're really so important. And they kind of fit very well together if you are a be, being and and you believe in, in what you are and who you are, um, then you want to belong. And also be- benevolence, I think, hmm. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> that's but, the one I was thinking of the most. I bet. Because we've talked about that as we've moved through the last few radio shows on how 
maybe part of our life issue that's going on right now is we don't have enough benevolence? What do you think? I was going to say, that's the one that uh, is probably the easiest to say and Mm. the hardest to do. Mm. Benevolence. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know why. It's not like, uh, I mean, we don't have instance after instance or example after example of how that stuff always works out. Mm -mm. You know, or or even when it does it, I mean, we have, you know, that's 0.001% of the time when benevolence doesn't work out like somebody wants it to or if it, you know, it turns out to be, you know, someone's downfall or something like that. And ah. a lot of times, even if it's somebody's downfall, it's because they're, they're, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, uh, they're, they're too giving, maybe too not too giving, but no? the, the meaning of what they were trying to do or their purpose behind it may have not been on the up and up from the, from the get go. Hmm. So. Give us an example of that. I think this is great. I, the, oh, well, I mean, and I it's I'm kind not of, to... <laughs> No, it's not a I, I hear, I know you don't want to be a distractor from the belonging, but, but I do think that a big piece of belonging is truly um, the benevolence piece. I'm having trouble saying it. Benevolence piece, because so many times people... If, it's because giving should start with a B. Somehow or another. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just digging for the B word for benevolence. Mm. If only giving started with a B, it'd be so much easier. But anyway. But no, I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying about how that can, uh, I think that can, that can sidetrack people. If you're, if you, if you don't have the right intention with your benevolence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, listeners, you jump in the conversation at any time because I think this is a really, really important topic that sometimes we don't quite understand completely the meaning of this and and the depth of belonging and what it can do for your sense of well-being and your mental health. This is Mental Health Month, and I know you're going to hear a lot on this radio station about mental health because it is very, very important. But what I want to do is talk about some of the issues that give us that good mental health. We know, you know, good nutrition, good exercise, sleep, all of that, but just like I said at the beginning, um, belonging is is truly almost as important as food and shelter. And it goes back in time, back to the primitive world. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit as we, we move on. Because, um, you know, the individuals have a good sense of belonging have more meaningful relationships with others. They tend to appreciate people more. They have closer bonds. And and also, um, if you feel like you're belonging, often you're able to share activities, customs, rituals. There's a lot of comfort in the support of these kinds of relationships. And and, you know, if you're in a group where you feel like belong, you belong, a lot of that is mutually cherished, right? You value a lot of the same values. So, again, we have mentioned this on, on this radio show in here many times, is, is one of the issues um, – that we have that is ongoing and perhaps creating more loneliness and um, more disenfranchisement is is some of it that we think everybody has to be like-minded and and think just like we do to feel like you belong in a group or they belong in your group. Perhaps that's one of the problems that we we keep stumbling across. I don't know. Um, like to hear from you listeners as we move along in this. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. You know, like I said, we as humans are, are really social, social, social creatures. And, um, you know, intimate connections with family and personal relationships are just big contributors to to who who we are 
And, um, you know, the opposite is true for people who have no close relationships or no group that they feel appreciated. Um, and, and I wonder if that's part of the difficulties that we're having so much with mental health issues because people who who don't feel like they have a close relationship with a group often feel sort of diminished as an individual which contributes to loneliness and sadness again sort of that op- op- oppositeness of of belonging And then, you know, um, besides just that personal sadness that goes along with loneliness, we know that a prolonged state of isolation um, imposes those major health risks that I've already mentioned. Um, But I just want to, to highlight some of them that have truly been linked to not having a sense of belonging. Um, diabetes, autoimmune diseases often are made worse, not the cause, but often made worse by um, not belonging, alcohol abuse or other substance abuse, anxiety, depression. Um, and, And then, of course, premature death can happen. So as we as we move along in in all of this, um, I want us to talk about not just loneliness again. I want to talk more about belonging and and how how that works. So listeners, do you think the need for individualism and each man for himself mantra has contributed to loneliness and the lack of belonging? That's one question I have to you. Do you think that every man for himself is limiting us? Thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and today we're talking about belonging. Belonging. Why is that so important? Why is that like food and shelter to us? Why do we need to belong? And do you feel, listeners, like you belong? Do you feel like that that you belong? are part of a group where you really feel connected? And is this something that has helped you through life? I'd love to hear about that group, perhaps, that was there, that is there for you. And what does it give you in your life? And and how would you encourage others to perhaps join a group, a team? Um, You know, there have been writings that almost any group any group, whether it's it's a, a classroom gl- group, a work group, a church group, even gangs. And I'm not encouraging anybody to join a gang, but that's why people join gangs, because they don't have a sense of belonging somewhere else. So listeners, give us a call and, and tell us what what those groups do for you and perhaps how you might encourage others to jump in and join. I, I, I have a, an example that I've, I've put on radio before. I'm in a church group, but I'm in a garden club group, which is new for me in the last few years and, and something that um, has helped enhance my love that I already had for, for gardening and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I feel like I belong, and we have a common interest. Are we all very different who belong to this garden club? Yes. I mean, I don't even know what their political sway is. I have no idea for several of the members as to what school they went to. But I will say that we belong to this group because we have a common interest. So. Think about that. Join in the conversation. So I want to go a, a little bit further with that um, that reason behind belonging. Um, Abraham Maslow, who was a famous American psychologist um, between 1950 and 1970, essentially, created the hierarchy of needs. And again, we've talked about this before on this show. He stressed the importance on focusing on the positive qualities of people. 
And he has a pyramid hierarchy of need, and it's really interesting. Um, you know, of course, he puts down on the bottom of the pyramid the very most um, basic needs, like food and shelter. But but then right in the middle, right in the middle of the pyramid is the sense of belonging, and um, and felt like it was one of those things that was very, very important to to be a part and, and to belong. And, you know, um, I don't know if any of you remember the No Man as is an Island that John Doan wrote. He um he he always it was it was not actually a poem, it was a bit of prose that he wrote. And it's it's a single verse um, that's in there. And I think basically what he was say- saying is that, um, you know, he, he, he liked it to a continent and that that no no man is a single part and can stand alone like an island, but but is part of a whole and should be part of a whole. And so I think you know he was he he wrote back what in the 1600s. So you know for a very long time we've we've talked about belonging and how important that is. So um, the other thing, uh, another quote that I think is um, or a word that Bishop Desmond Tutu often um, invoked the the Bantu concept of umbutu. And he said that's the essence of humanity, caring for one another within small and large communities. So are we doing that? Are we taking care of each other? Are, are, we, are we really trying to make sure that um, people belong? What do you think? So, you know, as as we're moving through this, um, listeners, uh, when you have had something wonderful or terrible happen in your life, did you feel that these groups to which you felt that you belonged were part of the reason that you were able to celebrate your joy even more than doing it sort of alone? Or... Did it help you deal with the terrible event that helped you come out on the other side? I mean, many of us have had terrible events, um, death of a, of a spouse, death of a sibling, um, the loss of something, or something majorly happened to us. And, you know, you walked into a room and into a group to which you belonged, and people recognized something great happened and celebrated with you and cared, cared about it. All right, well, I want to go to the phones because I want to hear from you about where you think we are. And we'll, we'll start first with Kat and Mobile. Hi, Kat. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us again. Love hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. So in relation to your topic, um, I thought about several things. Um, more so how people in general want purpose and want to be able to contribute and how having purpose and contributing to something gives us uh, like a boost of self-esteem. And then I also think about um, a book that I read in my master's program that was called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog and how the mm-hmm. lack of socialization affected him and how that um, it just limited his brain function. It, might, it limited his mental capacity. Like, it, it does a lot. Um, and it depends on if you're religious or not. Um, but the word talks about man shouldn't be alone. It's not good for man to be alone which is why a woman was created. So be thankful, men. But, you know, it's just not good for people to be alone. We need the community. We need the sense of just having someone else to bounce our ideas off of and just to feel wanted or needed or like you're contributing. So those are just my thoughts. Uh, great thoughts and also very true and in, in issues that have have shown when people don't feel like 
they belong and perhaps feel disenfranchised, they tend to react in some majorly negative ways. And I wonder if if some of that is not a contributor to to some of the violence that we are having. Um, even in our own state, we've had two major issues just recently, and and it it seems like again um, we're we're not having the the caring and the benevolence as we were talking about the four four Bs. So, um, Kat, thanks for for starting off our conversation in this area because it's really important for us to keep in mind the reason this is an important topic. All right. Um, we are going to go to our next caller. We have, is it Shabazz from Quitman? Oh, thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think uh, a big uh, reason uh, that we all get up to ourselves, and, and, and if we don't get up to ourselves as individuals, we kind of get into our own little cult or, or clique, sometimes we call it, uh, is because, um, you know, we forget that we are social beings. God made us to be social. And, um, and you know, and I think that we can look beyond what we see uh, in front of us on the physical or the surface of a person and, and look within that person, uh, it would it would encourage us to be more social, you know. Um, you know, we we, have, we come from different tribes or different nations. We come from different cultures, you know. And, and I think if we can uh, be encouraged to explore the different cultures of a person as opposed to uh, how we've been taught to see that person traditionally, uh, that would lead to uh, 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 decrease in violence, a decrease in even in sexual harassment that we see, um, uh, and it would make uh, the society a much better place to live. And last but not least, I'll be very quick. You know, another term that's called uh, we need to recognize each other. And uh, the, the, the the second syllable in that word recognize is, is, is cog, like cognition, you know, mm-hmm. which means to really think, to really think about who we are, where we are, where we're from, uh, and then see other people in that same, uh, on that same level so that we can, instead of seeing each other on the surface level, we can see uh, each other's cultures, uh, traditions, customs, etc., and that would help us to grow uh, in a positive way. And it would lessen the need for depression. It would lessen the. I mean, I'm sorry. It would lessen the cause for depression and and mm-hmm. and all of these other negative negative uh, experiences mm-hmm. that we go through. So, I'm trying to mean to be so long. No, you made some beautiful points, Shabazz. And I, I want to emphasize um, something that you said, because this is something I definitely wanted to cover, is that so many times we we don't recognize the value of those being in a group with us who are maybe a little bit different than we are culturally um, or Age-wise, I mean, how much did I learn from older individuals around me? And I still learn from um, the the 30-year-old people I work with. I love it because they know things I don't. They've learned things that I haven't. But the older individuals have so much history and knowledge behind, not just age differences, but you mentioned the, the cultural differences also, and how broadening and enlightening it can be in our lives if we allow ourselves to belong to groups that are diverse, that that are not the same, right? So really important for us to keep that in mind. So thank you for your call. I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, 
I think that I just want to tell everybody I'd love to hear from you. These are great words that are coming out. We're going to John Davis in Chateau Ridgeland. Oh, I'd like to make the point that some of the monsters of history have been great geniuses at making people feel they belong. Mm. The Hitler youth, uh, the, the sense that they were doing something marvelous for their country, and they had their uniforms, and they had their handshakes, and they had their ceremonies, and they were quite willing to sacrifice themselves while they did terrible things to those who were told were outside the group. This has happened again Mm -hmm. and again. Mm -hmm. And this is why belonging, although it it is inevitable, it's how we become human, can be manipulated into absolutely horrible things. And yes, I'm thinking of some events like January 6th, Mm -hmm. where decent, ordinary people found themselves doing ghastly things because they thought they belonged to a group and were mm-hmm. meeting its norm. Mm. What can we, what, how can we recognize an evil group? Oh, gosh, John, you bring up such an incredible topic. And I would, I think this is something that bears some discussion because you're absolutely right. Our intense need our intense need for belonging, and it's part of innate human human nature, um, the desire to belong sometimes gets us in a terribly wrong direction because initially that intense desire to belong sort of clouds our inability to really recognize what we are belonging to and what that meaning is about. So you may get directed in thinking that to belong, you all all have to think about exactly the same thing, have exactly the same purpose and exactly the same goal, whether that's to be the superior human being or to have everyone um, believe, you know, that that an election wasn't valid, whatever it is. Um, but sometimes um, that intense feeling of belonging makes us do horrible things um, just so we can stay apart, a part of it, even when in your mind. And if you listen to people from January the 6th, many of them have said they got caught up in it. Um, The same thing happens with gang violence. Kids who get in there just to have a friend and a group all of the sudden, right, get get sidebarred into doing horrible things just so they can stay a group. Jay, I know you have something to say here. Yeah, I would say this, the the sense of belonging. Yeah, um, maybe this and, and, you know, this is my platform this is my soapbox the the two party political system yeah maybe if we had more than two parties people that don't belong to one party wouldn't feel like they have to join the other party that tried to overrun the capitol building to still have a place of belonging that's my only point it's a good one yeah but to to play to your exactly the the, the our political system regardless of which one you subscribe to or if you subscribe to any of them i mean that's 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 a a prime example of of what you're talking about right here Mm -hmm. is the 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 need to belong and a sense of belonging and and what people will do to find it and have it and feel that uh and and again it just politics maybe more than anything else in this specific country will drive people to do things that they don't even know that they're doing. And to, to, our, to our caller's point, how many people act out of their minds, you know, based on the drives of their political interests that, that are not like that in any other aspect of their life? That's, that's, the th- that's what's scary to me. It is. But it's driven by that emotion, that, that, that drive emotion. to belong. Yeah. And I know a lot of times we stop. And we, we stop digging at politics. But I think it is interesting, and it's, it's great that you've brought this to our attention, that there is a, 
you know, there's a there's a deeper dive. There's another connection. There's a line out of just people doing bad things. Right. No one just, you know. No. Humans no. aren't people that wake up and think, how can I just create chaos amongst the world? Things that happens, but there are connectors that build to those points. And I think it's great that you're bringing this up because it kind of shows some of that underworking and that some of that reverse engineering that gets us to where we make these terrible decisions that on the surface look so easy to avoid. Yeah, it it's a spiral and and you really don't mean to do it. Um, so, John, John Davis, thanks so much for that point, because it's a really good one. So what do we need to do? We'll talk about that as we move along in the show. What do we need to do to better belo- to belong, but to belong to a, a gr- group that enhances our lives, that makes us better and helps us live longer, not shortens our lives, right? Absolutely. Thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Today we're talking about longing, belonging, not longing, but belonging. Um, and and how can we how can we feel that we belong? How can we be in a group that enhances our lives? Um, and and what does that entail? How much do you need to give back to be part of that belonging group? We really haven't talked about that. So in a few minutes, we'll start talking about building a sense of belonging. Um, so what I, what I want us to do is, is talk through this. Um, how do you build a sense of belonging? Um, and and do we do things that sometimes exclude people? So, um, I want to step through something. Um, some seek to belong by excluding others. Okay, that reflects the idea that there must be those who really don't belong in order for us to feel like we do belong. You know, maybe a single instance of being excluded can undermine how we feel. Um, I think many out there who are listening have felt excluded when they wanted to belong to a group and they weren't allowed to. Um, What do you think happens with that? Um, You know, Something can happen really early in life where you you sort of learn how to exclude others, the friend groups, even in kindergarten, where children will often exclude a child so that they can have an exclusive friend group, right? Um, Do you think that some of this is innate or is that behavior that we we model? You know, I was talking... um, as I was planning this radio show, I was talking to my husband, and and he he says he really truly believes that some of this is just innate behavior. Primates do it, right? Um, in a lion pride, uh, competing males are definitely excluded. Um, so, so listeners, do you think we as a Adults teach that kind of exclusionary behavior. You know, we've talked about how you can get into a gang or uh, a terrible cult or something else that um, even even like the Hitler followers mentioned by one of our earlier callers, um, John Davis, how how you can get into something like that that is is terribly damaging. But is that because maybe some of those individuals felt excluded from other groups, so they migrated toward bad groups because those were the people who welcomed them with open arms and made them feel valued? Is that what we are doing? And and are we moving people by not allowing them to belong? Are we moving people into areas of life and groups in which they should not belong, but they have no choice because of this extreme desire to belong. I know I'm 
sort of talking in circles, but I bet you get me. Um, so I'd love to hear from a listener about that. Do you think our exclusion of some from groups that would benefit them to which they could belong. We exclude them, don't allow them to belong, don't understand their value because we're looking at perhaps surface, like one of our other callers mentioned, that surfaceness that we forget to look into the depths of a person. So jump in. I'd love to hear from you about that. But I do want to talk about how we can build a sense of belonging. Um, and and there, there are some ways that we can do that um, to make sure. Um, one way to work on increasing our sense of belonging is to look for ways that we are similar instead of focusing on how we are different. That's really important. Someone, I mentioned this earlier in the show, who is much older than us may have incredible value um, and may on the surface not seem like they should belong to the group, but, but in reality, they do. Okay, I'm going to stop there because we have a caller who wants to talk about maybe some learned behavior, Paul in Hattiesburg, that I'd, I'd like to bring in before I keep going on building belonging. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for calling. Oh, well, I couldn't help but call. I think it's such a fascinating topic that you're addressing. And when you mention children um, and whether it's nature or nurture, um, I just wanted to kind of share my thoughts on that. Please. Well, I think um, it's a little bit of both. Like many things, it's uh, hard to kind of exclude one side or the other. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Mm. So I think that children, you know, as parents can attest, are super perceptive, even uh, taking in things that we may not think that they are. And this question of exclusivity is built into so many aspects of our social lives that um, I think that it is uh, passed on in an unspoken way. If you look at, for example, um, travel accommodation, for example, and having classes that you pay higher to uh, be a first-class traveler, and then you are (laughs) um, basically at a higher status. And so the exclusive experience is something that we're willing to pay to gain, I think children understand that and, um, you know, are, have no problem sort of putting themselves at a higher station by standing on top of those who are excluded Mm. um, because they see that, you know, uh, around them in an unquestioned way. Mm. That's a good point. I was kind of giggling because when, if if anybody's flown in the last few years, um, you can. It's amazing the different divisions they have. Um, you know, it's not just for first class comfort and then basic, but it's I don't know. Um, I counted one time I was standing there waiting to board a flight, and there were like ten ten different groups. Um, it's pretty hilarious. How Why don't we board flights? from the back to the front? I don't know. Why don't we board flights from the back to the front? Because we like exclusivity, <laughs> as Paul is mentioning. Great question. Yes, I think so. But, yeah, it's, you know, exclusive experiences for, you know, paying extra for vacation that, or a country club. But, you know, it's everywhere. Um, you know, the types of things that some people can have access to that others cannot is just baked into the idea of what being successful is. And that's, um, I think, part and parcel of our, you know, um, capitalist dem- democracy. Yeah. Not proposing that it go away, but proposing that we do a little bit better job of including people, allowing everyone to belong, um, would be a good thing, right? So. I do think so. Um, you know, when you start talking about cutting into, you know, 
nonprofits and corporations' abilities to, you know, uh, develop and to succeed that can become, I'm sure, uh, a little bit of friction there. But I do think so uh, when you uh, are dealing with children to have them recognize um, that this is not necessarily uh, something to be accepted without questioning because uh, I think also parents that have had children that have been on the excluded side know how painful that can be. And like, as you mentioned earlier, driving them into friend groups or social groups that may not have their best interests at heart because they have no other place to be. Right. Right. And and not only either driving them into other friend groups that perhaps are destructive to their well-being, but but also driving them into depression and even suicide. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so it is, you know, we keep talking about what do we need to do to um, have fewer of our adolescents anxious or depressed? Or what do we need to do to, to keep some of, of what's going, the, the horribleness, is that a word, that is going on <laughs> in our world? Um, if we just were kinder and more inclusive, I'm pretty sure things yeah. would get better. And so I agree with you. Yeah, my husband and I went back and forth, and maybe a little bit, bit of of um, the the need um, to exclude people and and that kind of thing is in a, in a. But I do think that in general we have a lot of terrible models out there. I really do. Indeed. Yeah. Well, so, thank you for having me on. Okay. Thanks for calling, Paul. Okay, we're going to go back to Shabazz, who's called back in Clinton. Hi, Shabazz. You have some more Hi, words for you. us? Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is an excellent show. Um, uh, what I was going to say is this, is that when you talk about exclusion, uh, we, we show uh, oftentimes we look at, as I said earlier, uh, what we see on the surface. But um, those are our differences. But one thing that we all have in common is our humanity. We're all human. You know, that is the, you know, we have different cultures, we have different traditions, we have different races and ethnicity, but we're all human. And that is the one unifying thread that unites us and ties us together. And, um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't see myself as a black man. I see myself as a human. You know, right. I don't see uh, Caucasians as white people. I see them as human people. You know, uh, they're just, you know, um, I think, you know, we, we put so much emphasis on the race and these kind of things until it, it, it acts more of a divisionary. And sometimes I think it's a tactic, you know, by people who want to stay in control. You know, uh, more than anything else. And my last comment is this: is that is that um, we put our own responsibility too much. I, I, I heard the gentleman before mention the word democracy, and the other gentleman, your co-host, mentioned uh, the two political parties. We put too much of our uh, personal responsibility uh, into the hands of our politicians, and they use them. Uh, to divide us so that they can stay in office. It's kind of like good cop, bad cop, you know. Uh, two, of the, two of the major discussions that are going on now is like abortions and, and gun control. And those are individual uh, issues. You know, they're not political issues. And, um, and because we put those issues in the hands of politicians, they use them to uh, keep division among us, and I think that if, um, you know, there's no way that anything in anybody's, you know, private life should be in uh, a question before the Supreme Court, you know, so... Uh, yeah, I think um, we are unfortunately allowing so much to be legislated when we should just try to be good human beings and figure it out in our personal lives, but... Well, Shabazz, thank you for for calling. I think we just have a a few seconds in our last 
um, part of the show, I just want to say, just keep in mind uh, a good way to build that sense of belonging for others is to work on the acceptance of others. And I think several of our callers have talked about that, how we really need to work on just accepting others and caring about them. Um, And then we don't feel like we belong, right? All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks to our callers. And Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from people like you, our listeners. So keep it up. If you'd like to hear this show again or any other past podcast, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy, relatively speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by my producer, Jay White. Our call screener today was Abram Nanny. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking, right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.